Hello, my name is Tasha Ward, and I'm here today to talk to you about the F word, feminism. As you know, or maybe you don't know, March is that month where we take 31 days to celebrate Women's History Month. So what I'd like to do is take a look back at all of the fabulous feministas that paved the way for women's rights, and then we'll flash forward to today to showcase women in our community who continue to inspire and empower women in their communities. The Triangle Waste Company was in many ways a typical factory in the heart of Manhattan at the northern corner of Washington Square East, located in the Ash Building. Low wages, excessively long hours, and unsanitary and dangerous working conditions were the hallmarks of sweatshops. The Ash Building was owned by Max Blanc and Isaac Harris. On November 22nd, Local 25 of the International Ladies Garment Workers Union held a meeting to discuss a general strike. Thousands of workers packed the hall. 19-year-old Clara Lemlick was sitting in the crowd listening to the speakers, who were mostly men. They were cautious of even discussing a strike. Clara was one of the founders of Local 25. When the meeting star attraction, the American Federation of Labor President Samuel Gomper spoke, the crowd went wild. After he finished, Clara expected a strike vote. Instead, yet another speaker went to the podium. Tired of hearing speakers for more than two hours, Clara made her way to the stage, shouting, I want to say a few words in Yiddish. Once she got to the podium, she continued, I have no further patience for talk, as I am one of those who feels and suffers from the things pictured. I move that we go on general strike now, the audience cheered and voted for a strike. The next morning, throughout New York's garment district, more than 15,000 shirtwaist makers walked out. They demanded a 20% pay raise, a 52-hour work week, and extra pay for overtime. The local union, along with the Women's Trade Union League, held meetings in English and Yiddish at dozens of halls to discuss plans for picketing. When picketing began the following day, more than 20,000 workers from 500 factories had walked out. More than 70 of the smaller factories agreed to the union's demands within the first 48 hours. Meanwhile, the fiercely anti-union owners of the Triangle Factory met with owners of the 20 largest factories to form a manufacturing association. Many of the strike leaders worked there, and the Triangle owners wanted to make sure that other factory owners were committed to doing whatever it took, from using physical force to political pressure, to not back down. Soon after, police officers began arresting strikers, and judges fined them and sentenced some of them to labor camps. The struggle and spirit of the women strikers caught the attention of suffragists. Wealthy progressive women like Anne Morgan, daughter of J.P. Morgan, and Alva Belmont believed that all women, rich and poor, would be treated better if women had the right to vote. Alva saw the labor uprising as an opportunity to move the women strikers' concerns into a broader feminist struggle. She arranged huge rallies, fundraising events, and even spent nights in court paying the fines of arrested strikers. The coalition of the wealthy suffragists and shirtwaist strikers quickly gained momentum and favorable publicity. 15,000 shirtwaist makers in Philadelphia went on strike, and even replacement workers at the Triangle Factory joined the strike, shutting it down. A month into the strike, most of the small and mid-sized factories settled with the strikers, who then returned to work. The large factories, who were the holdouts, knew they had lost the war of public opinion and were finally ready to negotiate. They agreed to higher pay and shorter hours but refused even to discuss what is called a closed shop. For these young women workers, the strike had become more than taking a stand for a pay raise and reduced work hours. They wanted to create a union with real power and solidarity. In February 1910, the strike finally settled. The few remaining factories rehired the strikers, agreed to higher wages and shorter hours, and recognized the union in name only, resisting a closed shop. Local 25, which prior to the strike represented only a few hundred members, now had over 20,000. However, workers at Triangle went back to work without a union agreement. 
management never addressed their demands, including unlocked doors in the factory and fire escapes that functioned. Near closing time, on Saturday afternoon, March 25, 1911, a fire broke out on the top floors of the Ash Building in the Triangle Waste Company. Within minutes, the quiet spring afternoon erupted into madness, a terrifying moment in time, disrupting forever the lives of young workers. By the time the fire was over, 146 of the 500 employees had died. The survivors were left to live and relive those agonizing moments. The victims and the families, people who had passed by and witnessed the desperate leaps from the ninth floor and the entire city of New York would never be the same. Survivors recounted the horrors that they had endured and passerbys and reporters told their stories of pain and terror that they had witnessed. In the weeks that followed, the grieving city identified the dead, sorted out their belongings, and reeled in numbered grief at the atrocity that could have been averted with a few precautions. The International Ladies' Garment Workers' Union proposed an official day of mourning. The grief-stricken city gathered in churches, synagogues, and finally, in the streets. Protesting voices arose, bewildered and angry at the lack of concern and the greed that had made this possible. The people demanded restitution, justice, and action that would safeguard the vulnerable and the oppressed. Workers flocked to union quarters to offer testimonies, support mobilization, and demand that Triangle owners Harris and Blanc be brought to trial. The role that strong unions could have helped in helping prevent such tragedies became clear. Grieving families and much of the public felt that justice had not been done. Justice, they cried, where is justice? 23 individual civil suits were brought against the owners of the Ash Building. On March 11, 1914, three years after the fire, Harrison Blanc settled. They paid $75 per life lost. Even today, sweatshops have not disappeared in the United States. They keep attracting workers in desperate need of employment and illegal immigrants who may be anxious to avoid involvement with governmental agencies. Recent studies conducted by the U.S. Department of Labor found that 67% of Los Angeles garment factories and 63% of New York garment factories violate minimum wage and overtime laws. 98% of LA garment factories have workplace health and safety problems that are serious enough to lead to injuries or death. While many of us were very familiar with the Triangle Factory and the devastation it brought to New York City, it's very interesting to take a look at how many thousands of women were involved in their labor unions to make it so that this kind of tragedy wouldn't happen again.